My name is Blake Verbanek. I grew up in a small town called Gullis, Michigan. Like a lot of small towns, it had its dark urban legend that drifted through the consciousness of the people growing up and living there. Ours centered around a place we all just called the cannery. When this story begins, it was an abandoned, burned-out hulk down near the docks, fenced off behind a gate at the foot of some unused railroad tracks. In its heyday back in the 60s, it had employed 400 people or so. But from old photos, you can tell it was always ugly and awkward, unkempt, poorly maintained. The company that owned the cannery had never been much of a success. In 1987, when I was a junior at Gullis High School about four miles away, the cannery, already on its last financial legs and employing only about 120 people or so, came to a nasty end. In trying to stave off their debt somehow, the owners had taken to basically renting out two floors of the place to a chemical plant, which used that space to store huge drums of stuff they shouldn't have, including a flammable acid used in cleaning airplane engines. During a heat wave, the drums weren't cooled properly, and somehow two of them simply exploded. A fire started and swept through the fourth floor. A worker named Menko Dubach had been blinded by the acid released in the explosion, and he suffered severe lung damage from the chemical smoke that ensued as he stumbled around, screaming, trying to find a way to safety. The cannery was shut down immediately and it never reopened, falling into the kind of decrepitude that made it look more like a massive haunted house than an industrial building. Awfully, Menko Dubach was found dead on the third floor of the cannery 11 months after it was closed. Homeless, he'd been for a short time living inside the cannery for some reason. He never lived to see what would surely have been a whopping wrongful injury payout. He'd only had an IQ of 85, they said, and no one had known anything about him except that he'd been quiet and didn't speak English so well. And then in the summer of 88, he simply died at the age of 50. Of natural causes, the paper said, but people tended to believe that the lung damage and despair over his blindness hastened his poverty and death. So maybe you couldn't call the Menko Dubot story an urban legend because it was real. It had really happened. They buried him in a pauper's grave, and the cannery sat behind its vast rectangular fence near the docks day after day, season after season, rotting and neglected. An empty hulk no one noticed unless you were strange enough to go walking down there, where there was so little human activity. One night during my winter break from college in 1990, I and some friends were hunkered down in Gullis's main dive bar around midnight, watching the snow fall through the windows. My girlfriend at the time was across the room. She'd gotten to talk into a backpacker who was passing through town. When the guy was in the bathroom, she told me he was a really nice college dropout who was tramping on foot all over the east, and he was actually looking for a sofa to sleep on for the night, and she hinted that my folks wouldn't mind terribly if he crashed there, would they? They actually wouldn't. And I myself was trying to be a bit of a hippie back then, so I decided to talk to him for a while, make sure he wasn't a psycho. And at one in the morning, I did give him a lift back to my parents' place, where I was staying. His name was Chris. He was scruffy, unshaven, but very cool, a former anthropology student who couldn't make up his mind about what he wanted out of life. On the drive to the house, he was pretty effusive with his thanks for the sofa offer. Not because of the cold so much, although that was part of it, of course. He'd had a very bad scare the night before trying to slum it with his sleeping arrangements. He tried to sleep in some old building at the edge of town, he said, and it turned out he meant the cannery. I was fascinated, and I wanted to hear the story. As he told it, us starting to really creep along slowly because the snow was getting a tad dangerous to maneuver through, he lost all his previous good humor. It just vanished more with every detail. He'd been exhausted when he wandered near the cannery and freezing. 
and he vowed that he would get inside somehow or die trying, because he just couldn't take the elements anymore. And, not knowing what the place was, he had a gnawing urge to find out. There's a misguided sense of youthful adventure for you. So he'd found a section of fencing that was more drastically tilting over than most, and he fought his way up and over, wrenching his foot painfully upon landing on the other side. From there he circled the building until he spotted a window that looked partially open. He built himself a kind of stepladder from old debris over the course of 15-20 minutes, and sure enough the window was open and he got in. Chris couldn't describe the layout of the place much since he only had three matches and he used them sparingly. He just wanted to find a spot where he could stretch out his sleeping bag and lay down for a few hours sleep. It seemed like every step he took in the dark he kicked some piece of detritus. He thought he could hear rats, both above and below him. He made his way up to the second floor, which was warmer, but cavernous and echoing, and he remembered seeing the silhouettes of tall machines he didn't understand. He had to use one of the matches to avoid stumbling over a bunch of beams strewn around. On one of those beams, he saw lettering covered in a thin sheen of dust. He couldn't quite say how the lettering had been made, except that it was handwriting, and may have just been thick magic marker. He remembered that the letters sometimes curved too hard and broke at the edge of the beam, as if they'd been written in the dark, and the author had simply missed sometimes. The letter said, It's time to work but I have no eyes. Chris curled up in a corner and he tried to sleep, but he was already scared. The place was just so big, so dark. It was almost two hours before he blanked out, and then when he came awake again and checked his watch, he'd only been out for an hour and a half, and it was a ways to go till morning. He decided he couldn't make it through the night in there. He rose, rolled his sleeping bag back up, and lit his final match, to find his way out again. Upon lighting that match, he saw something on the cement floor about five feet from where he'd lain. More writing. It was that same sentence. It's time to work, but I have no eyes. Except Chris swore that the writing hadn't been there when he'd laid down. An area of dust had been brushed away so that the letters could be written, he said. You could see the difference between that spot and what lay around it. Chris had half walked, half run toward the stairwell, felt his way down it, then navigated through the shadows to the window he'd come in through. He didn't dare look back. He remembered starting to make little clicking noises in his throat due to sheer terror, and he'd actually finally cried out upon making his way back down his improvised stepladder needing to vocally let out his fear. He'd had a lot of trouble getting back over the fence. When he finally did, he limped back toward town and paid for a motel room, something he'd sworn he'd never do and couldn't really afford to. He'd slept until two the next afternoon. After that story, I made Chris and myself a giant 2 a.m. meal of pancakes, eggs, and bacon, and I told him the history of the cannery. And when I talked about Menko Dubach, his stare became stony and distant, and though he kept trying to smile, it kept failing him. He was a very nice guy, and I was glad I could give him a sofa and a big meal. He headed north the next morning. I thought about the cannery very differently after that, naturally. During summers home from school, I drove by the property sometimes, looking at the building's dead bulk against the night sky, glancing at all those windows. I told a few people the story, trusted friends. It seemed like nobody knew anyone who had been inside the building since the closure, or even heard stories of kids going in on a lark. I graduated in 1992, and I moved into an apartment in the middle of town, I worked in my father's law office, and I prepared to apply to graduate school. Apparently, the corporation that owned the cannery 
had long refused to sell it or bulldoze it, believing the property so close to the waterfront would be worth a great deal of money if they waited for an economic resurgence to come to Gullis. But the fairly hard times in town remained. Finally, though, the local newspaper reported the property had in fact been sold in principle to a land developer, and demolition would take place within the year. Two days before Thanksgiving, I I drove over to my older sister's house to watch her six-year-old daughter for the night while my sister and her husband went out for their anniversary dinner. They lived on High Street, pretty close to the docks. I played a game with Paula and we watched three episodes of her favorite cartoon show. My sister called at about nine to check in. She said I might have to perform what she called a little safety check before I put Paula to bed because for the last few nights she'd been getting scared over something she claimed to see outside. My sister was sure it was nothing but overactive imagination. As Paula brushed her teeth, I asked her about it. She assured me she wasn't scared, but she thought someone was living at what she called the Canoe Museum. The Canoe Museum, she said, and then she led me to her bedroom window and pointed out. We were only eight blocks from the cannery, which is what she meant. We were quite elevated. We could actually see down on it beyond the edge of the neighborhood. For the last two nights, she'd seen a man standing just inside the outer fence where it jutted out near the old railroad tracks. There were two functional streetlights down there and a little splash of rusty light fell across the spot where no traffic ever went by anymore. What was he doing out there? I asked her. And she said, nothing. But she didn't think he belonged there. And then she bounced off toward the kitchen to get an unauthorized handful of grapes. As I tucked her in, I assured her that I'd make sure no one was down there tonight. She said, okay, and I turned off the light. I would have sat up in the living room, watching the cannery, but Paula's bedroom had the only good vantage point, so I sat and tried to watch TV instead, looking at the clock. I was trying to remember if I'd ever told my sister the story of Chris the Drifter and his night in the cannery, and I was convinced I never had. As she almost always did, Paula came out into the living room about an hour after I tucked her in, asking if she could have a drink of water. I went and got it, and when I returned, she'd already gone back into her bedroom. She was standing near her window in the dark. She said, look, there he is. And my blood ran cold as I set the water down on the sill and looked out. But I didn't see anything down near the fence that surrounded the cannery. Even if I had, that area was so murky and far away that anything down there could have been anything else. Impossible to prove as human. No, no, Paula said. You're looking in the wrong place. And she pointed higher at the cannery itself. And there I saw it. In a high west window, one obscured by years of filth. The figure of a man. There was some sort of dim light on in the room he stood in. The first light I had ever seen in the building, I swear, since its closure. Almost as soon as I saw it, that light went out, and with it, that unmistakable silhouette disappeared. I couldn't even speak for a moment. It was Paula who said, I'm scared of that man. I guided her away from the window and told her it was okay that I knew him. That was the security guard who worked there and made sure no kids came in and hurt themselves on the old machines. It was dangerous in there. This she seemed to at least half believe. She sipped some water and went compliantly back to bed. To avoid worrying her, I made a point of not looking through the window again, not once. I went into the kitchen, drew the sliding door shut, and I took out my cell phone. I called the police, telling them I had spotted someone inside the old cannery on Shepherd Street, and if it was a slow night, maybe they could 
send a patrol car past and take a quick look. They thanked me and I sat again in the living room, praying that my sister and her husband would get home soon so that maybe I could go down toward Shepherd Street. They did. Barely ten minutes after I made the call, they came in, making as little noise as possible so as not to wake Paula. I didn't tell them anything then. I wanted to be quick. So I simply said everything was fine, and I wished them good night. Hiking my way down High Street, I kept an eye on what I could see of the cannery, but my view was quickly obstructed by houses. It was a 20-minute walk before I found myself at the train tracks. A left turn took me around the corner from a defunct liquor store, and the outer fence was just ahead of me. If I listened real close, I'd be able to hear waves lapping against the docks well beyond the property. As always, the building revealed nothing of itself but darkness. I saw a police car parked on the curb near its east side. I stood, waiting, scanning the windows high above for the slightest flicker of light. I saw the patrol woman walking from around the side of the cannery. She pushed on the east gate and then turned and locked it back up. I jogged toward her. She was very pleasant. She told me they had calls like mine every once in a great while, but they'd never actually found anyone on the premises. They had keys on permanent loan from the absentee landlord. Tonight, the cop had entered on the first floor and gone up just one more and shown a flashlight around and called out and listened. I had foolishly left out the detail when I'd called that the man I'd seen had been on the fourth or fifth floor. But I didn't press her. She said she wouldn't be terribly surprised if some homeless man had found his way in, but not until there was a real problem would they seriously get involved. She was just glad the place was going to be demolished soon enough. She said her kids were way too interested in the place. She'd taken a few photos when she was inside, which made her think someone had in fact been there very recently. I saw casual shots of isolated spots inside the cannery as lit by her flash. I was confused at first because none of them showed any sort of object or evidence of human presence. It was just the predictable, rotting interior of an old, abandoned building that was about to be torn down. Then she got to the last picture. Yes, the writing on that wall did in fact seem quite recent. Inked, somewhat messy letters six inches high read, I have to leave, but I have no eyes. The early 90s came and went but still no sign of the cannery coming down. Something about a legal squabble over ownership, property issues no one seemed to really understand. I upset my father by opting for medical school over law school, and I left Gullis for Connecticut, and for a long time I was only back in town once a year or so. The cannery became a dark running joke in town in my absence. An eyesore that had been around so long it had superseded the beautiful town common as its best-known feature. I chose to set up my first practice back in Gullis so I could care for my ailing father. The turn of the 21st century found me a general practitioner living in the nicest part of town, far out of sight of the cannery. Over the years, I'd kept my ear to the ground about stories related to it. No one had any. I'd only told a few out-of-towners my pair of chilling anecdotes about it. My wife would have been very disturbed by them, and my father would have just scoffed. I drove by the place a lot after my office day ended, once a week maybe, going well out of my way. Still no graffiti after all these years, which I found odd. The fencing had been strengthened in several places, and the locks on the two gates bolstered. Aside from that, the only instantly visible difference in the place between 1992 and 2002 was a few more broken windows. I knew enough about the law to know that occasional safety inspections would have to be conducted, but I also knew enough about the world to know that occasionally those things got 
conveniently overlooked or paid off for the sake of preventing code violations from being found, even vermin infestations. I forget exactly what year it was when I was at a Christmas party and talk turned to the cannery and if it would ever go away. One of the party guests, I think her name was Maris, said we had to wrap up the conversation before her husband came over. For years, he had refused to go anywhere near it. He developed a very serious, not-to-be-joked-about phobia about the place ever since he'd had a weird experience with it. Maris's husband had been at Spears Point, looking across the bay through binoculars, and he'd seen what looked like a man on the roof of the cannery, stark against the backdrop of the darkening sky. It looked like the man was in great distress, staggering wildly about, slapping at his eyes, as if he were being attacked by unseen insects or something. Maris's husband had looked away, finding it disturbing. For some reason, he never wanted to speak about. From that moment on, he tensed up terribly if he even got too close to the place. And he wouldn't even stay in the same room if the cannery came up in conversation. I am now 45 years old, still living in Gullis, father of two kids. I never left. My wife finds a charm here that I never really did. The county tried to sue the legal owners of the cannery some time ago to force them to sell or demolish it, but they failed miserably. It's comical, really. Some time back, I had a week all to myself while my wife took the kids to Arizona, and I spent an hour every single night watching the cannery from Spears Point. Useless. The place was dead as ever, and it seemed like it would remain so till the day I died. Five weeks ago began the end of the story. I was in the high street diner and I saw a man sitting alone at the counter, who I thought I recognized. It came to me after a while. It was Chris. Chris from all those years ago, the backpacker who had camped out on my sofa. He'd gotten a lot heavier, but it was definitely him. Those pale blue eyes, questioning eyes, were a giveaway. When we made uncertain eye contact, it was him who walked over to me and gave me the I bet you don't remember me speech. He smiled and said I had the exact same hairstyle as I did back then. In 1997, he'd actually entered the priesthood and worked everywhere from St. Louis to a remote Catholic mission in Peru. Just a year ago, he'd amazingly settled in Gullis, of all places, where he was working for the state school system, no longer part of the clergy. It hadn't worked out for him, he said mildly. He went back to the counter after a few minutes of catching up. On my way out upon paying the check, I couldn't resist sitting on the stool beside him and asking him if he remembered his encounter in the cannery. Very much, he said, very much. He did not say this with amused reminiscence. It was like I'd reminded him a cousin had died. I told him of my minor obsession with the place. He expressed a keen interest in hearing my stories, and we wound up discussing the cannery for more than an hour. He still had a faint bit of that youthful candor that led him to speak of things that were on his mind, that trait that I think made people want to offer him their sofa for a night 25 years ago. It turned out that, upon returning to Gullis for his job the May before, he'd made a point to walk past the cannery several times at night. He honestly believed that whatever was there was still there. It was a feeling in his bones. He had seen things, experienced things, during his first assignments for the priesthood outside the country that had kept his mind open to thoughts like that. It took me a bit of pressing to get that anecdote out of him. We were almost the only ones left in the diner by then. In Peru, he'd helped establish a tiny parish in a village west of Iquitos. He couldn't name one person there who did not, at least occasionally, attend his services, except one. 
a man of sixty named Arguetas. From what Chris knew of him, he was an intensely reclusive man who never spoke unless spoken to. An older parishioner told Chris one day that he hadn't truly been Arguetas for more than 25 years. The man had accidentally run over and killed his own brother while drunk one night, and some time afterward it was said the brother, Chiro, had cruelly taken him over, entered Arguetas' body and mind, and had been there ever since. Before the accident, he'd been a gregarious drinker and storyteller, and about a year after it, he'd fallen silent, removed himself from all village affairs, then virtually vanished into his tiny house for good. When Chris asked what the man did, he was told that he simply walked the sumac road. For hours each day, he shuffled up and down a half-mile stretch of packed dirt that had been cut off from the village by flooding years ago. Some of the locals brought food to him, and he still collected money from a decades-old work injury. Chris had become curious enough about the villagers' belief in Arguetas' possession that he had gone out to the sumac road one gray day to see if he was there. Sure enough, Chris had seen the man, dressed in a tattered gray suit, walking with great slowness toward the road's western endpoint in the woods, hat held in both hands. Chris thought this was the oldest man he had ever seen, far, far older than the villager's timeline suggested. Someone came to Chris soon after and said, Arguetas may have died, since he hadn't come out to get food or walk toward the sumac road for several days. No one seemed to want to go to his little house and see for themselves, so Chris went alone. When he got no answer to his knock, he entered the two-room house. Arguetas was in the bedroom adjoining the living room, lying under the covers. What Chris noticed even before he approached the bed was that the house seemed to have not a single trace of any personal mementos. No books, no papers, nothing on the walls, no possessions at all. Chris remembered one weird thought going through his head. A ghost needs no human amenities. Arguetas was, in fact, dead. But in death he was almost unrecognizable. Chris found himself looking at a man of sixty. Not the decrepit, ancient the villagers knew. When the authorities came to take Arguetas away, there was some question of his identity. But two women in the village were finally convinced to come forward and confirm that he'd had no children or living relatives, so it must have been him. The villagers prayed for his soul. Some seemed to have expected the transformation that they believed took place at the moment when the spirit of Arguetas' brother, sensing death was imminent and no longer able to observe the world and function so crudely through the body he'd overtaken and stripped of life for twenty-five years, returned to the grave. I hope the dead aren't really as mobile as that, Chris said to me. Chris and I shook hands and we assured each other only half-jokingly that we'd let each other know if we became aware of any developments involving the cannery. The way we exchanged email addresses made it a sure thing we really would. And then, just four days later, he contacted me. All he sent me was a link to a blog called Night Dares, written by an adventurous film student who lived outside of Pontiac and made it his hobby to explore supposedly haunted places, always illegally, he boasted. The cannery had come across his radar due to nothing more than a friend of his unearthing the story of Menko Dubach. He had no evidence of mysterious doings, but now he was vowing to make the cannery one of his next spelunking journeys. Late that night I sat at my computer for a half hour, summoning up the nerve to reply to Chris with a single sentence, which was this. Do you think we need to go in there now? So it was that the man his parishioners had once called Father Stankind and I drove to Shepherd Street on April 27, 2015. Parked, got out, and walked toward the bayside of the cannery. 
it was not quite four in the morning. We'd have to do it then, we decided, because it was simply our best chance to not be spotted. I told my wife I was going fishing. We had what we thought was a clever story cooked up in case of arrest, involving sounds of someone in distress heard inside the building. We weren't as agile as we once were, that was for sure, but the outer fence had still never been improved to the point where it could keep anyone out if they really wanted in. I boosted Chris up at a spot where there was very little good sight line from the houses on DeCartha Road, and with great effort he made it over. Landing on the other side was the biggest worry. It was kind of a fall, and he made it awkwardly. At first I thought he'd seriously hurt himself, but he was just shaken up. I remembered how he told me on that night back in 1990 how he'd wrenched his foot. I felt my own collision with the cracked pavement with every bone in my body, but we'd made it. We jogged around the corner of the building and completely out of sight, the piers beyond the property, visible now. I saw a boat way out there on the water, nothing to worry about. We regrouped and craned our necks up at the windows above us. There was just no way any of the doors were penetrable. We could smell the mildew from outside cloying. A lot of the broken windows had been done over with plastic sheeting at some point, an easy enough fix from outside, and we decided the closest one to where we were would be the target. A lot of the old debris around the place had in fact been taken away, so a makeshift pile to climb would have been a tough feat. But we'd come with a collapsible ladder, which I'd passed very carefully over the fence to Chris. My buck knife took apart the plastic sheeting on the window quickly, and we climbed into the cannery. Our point of entry turned out to be an office of some kind. A desk was still in there and two filing cabinets. I drew one of the rusty drawers open and put the buck knife in there and closed it up again. I didn't want it on me in case we were caught. It was hot in there, and I was sweating already. That odor of mildew was so strong I was suddenly glad I'd had nothing to eat for ten hours. We went into the outer hallway and through a door into a corner stairwell, the exact one Chris had once entered. We'd agreed beforehand to start on the fourth floor, where the fire had struck in 1987. We almost couldn't breathe in that stairwell. It was so fetid and so humid. Chris kept his flashlight beam at foot level as he ascended, and I kept mine higher. We saw no footsteps in the dust but ours. There was still a sign on the wall, faded and rusty, advising workers that there was to be no sitting on these stairs. We exited the stairwell into another hallway, went past what looked like a locker room, and emerged into a huge, mostly open area half-filled with huge metal racks, bolted to three of the walls, and storage pens made of wood and wire. A lot of them had obviously been dismantled, and some perhaps destroyed in the fire. We weren't looking for anything in particular. We explored individually in silence. Finally, Chris came over and whispered something to me as I was looking at some old boards and metal rods, and what I thought was the motionless tail of a rat peeking out from under them. He said, come here. You can see where the explosion scarred the wall. And I think he was right. A dark discoloration spread over a 30-foot patch on the east wall, and it was deeply pockmarked there all throughout. I looked around, wondered where Menko Dubach might have been standing when the explosion had happened. I'd begun to walk back toward the stairwell when Chris tapped me from behind and motioned to stop for a moment. He said, let's just listen. But I found it difficult to concentrate on what might be hiding within that silence because I was seeing Chris's face in the gloom, just barely visible with his flashlight held so low at his side, like seeing someone through the dark static of a TV station that's not coming in well. And his expression told me he was sensing something in the air that I couldn't. He was attuned to this place somehow, and I was not. 
I was just an outsider, feeling the usual terror of the dark and the unknown. But Chris was really here, reliving his hours back in 1990. And we went there, two floors below, to the spot where he remembered sleeping. As we moved through the gloom, he whispered to me what he thought we'd see as we went, as if he were trying to prove to me it had all happened just the way he described it. The machinery, so much of it covered in vast shrouds of tarpaulin. A snaking assembly line that spanned almost the entire floor, its belts frozen in time. Great flat work tables with broken pieces of metal lying all over them. The two spots where he'd seen the sentence he believed Menko Dubac had left for him no longer held any messages. Chris seemed both relieved and disturbed by this. We descended into the basement. There were exactly 40 steps in the stairwell that led down to it, as opposed to 20 separating each of the other floors. It got noticeably cooler when we went below ground. I pushed on the door that led into the cavernous open area. A small draft curled around us. We saw bins twice as tall as we were filled with God knows what, each bearing a list of stenciled serial numbers, meaningless. Gigantic load-bearing posts marched off into the distance at 20-foot intervals. The amount of rust that had eaten through them made me wonder if the entire place might just collapse someday. Chris spotted something near the basement's midpoint and trained his flashlight there. What we saw was strange enough to investigate. As we got closer, it got strange enough to forget about almost everything we'd already seen. There was an area where everything had been cleared and swept, and it had been done fairly recently, you could tell by the interruption in the dust. In that area, something had been constructed. Into gaps in the cement floor, which had been cracked and weakened by decades of water damage and then forced open to reveal the dirt beneath, had been driven three tall wooden posts, taller than we were, lined up in a row, the center one a little taller than the others. These crooked posts were bisected toward their tops with short horizontal boards that had been nailed into place. We were looking at giant crosses. The center one had been draped in a ripped wool blanket which fell away with one tug. I remember there was coarse animal hair all over it. Chris moved his flashlight very close to the crosses, going over every inch of them. They had no visible markings. The wood appeared very crudely hewn, not by machine. Carried in here, somehow. How else could they have appeared here? And at the base of the one in the middle, sitting there half on cement, half on old earth, was something that had way too much color for these surroundings. It was a bucket, a small, bright pink plastic bucket with a bright yellow plastic handle. A child's beach toy bought in a store, and recently enough so that it still kind of shone like new. I crouched and looked into it. A small object was inside. I remember thinking it was a crab at first, a grayish-brown corpse, and I winced. But it was a hand, a human hand, withered with age, shrunken, yet still somehow identifiable as a man's. Neither of us would touch it. We went deeper into the basement, but only got a few steps when the beams of our flashlights fell across a tan-colored stone, about four feet across, two feet high. Nothing that should have ever been found inside this building. A black and white photograph had been firmly taped to it. Words on the stone had been lettered quite carefully on the flattest part 
of its surface. Menko Dubach, they said, died July 1987, set free February 10, 2015, by Paula Kirk. February 10, 2015. That date was two and a half months ago. The photograph was actually a printout of one I had seen of Menko Dubach online. It had apparently been taken when he was in the army at age 18. He stared at us with sad, blank eyes. Who is Paula Kirk? Chris wondered aloud. And I said, That's my niece's name. Little Paula who I used to babysit, had grown up stormily in great conflict with her alcoholic father and a very religious mother. And she'd been in and out of trouble since the age of 13, always for simply disappearing for days at a time and mysteriously refusing to tell anyone where she'd been. She'd left home for Europe the day she was legally able, and my sister had only heard from her twice since then rarely knowing her exact whereabouts, only becoming more and more distressed over her daughter's increasingly strange appearance, as seen on a Facebook page on which Paula never posted anything but occasional photos and messages in German about moving from one place to the next. Who had helped her with this act laid out before us? Where had she come from? And where had she gone? Chris and I stuck close together as we explored the rest of the basement, but we found nothing. We returned to the display and read that inscription again and again. But never again did we look into that bucket. Eventually we left the basement, went up to the first floor again, and found our way out of the cannery. It was almost dawn. We felt we had to move very quickly at the end. The sight of headlights far off froze us once, but we remained unseen. We got into my car and I drove us away from there mostly in silence. I suppose we were both individually going over everything again in our minds. Before Chris got out of the car at his apartment house, he told me he'd send me an email soon. And he went inside to sleep. But the email which eventually came three days later didn't say much. Chris said he had to think about what we had seen some more. And then a week after that, he was gone. His last message to me said only that he'd decided to resume the research he'd failed to commit to all his life and would now follow it where it needed to go, which meant leaving Gullis, whose towering sinister landmark had truly been What drew him back? That was a confession I fully expected. There was nothing more for him here now. My questions about whether what he had to do involved leaving the country or research into people like my niece went unanswered. Meanwhile, I I haven't told my sister about what we found. Why should I? I keep waiting to see a headline in the local paper about something strange found by police, or maybe by a blogging trespasser even, in the basement of the old cannery. I don't think, though, that there's anything in the cannery to be afraid of anymore, technically. Yesterday I was talking to a realtor about moving to a bigger house in Beale Landing, ten miles down Obelisk Pike. I asked her if we could look at some places right on the river, on the south end of it, near an old historic church. She said absolutely, if I and my wife and kids had strong nerves. That was where people kept seeing a ghost recently, late at night. The one they'd taken to calling the Stumbling Man. 